Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics and we're going to have a look at these artifacts today. The Sega Dreamcast, the last uh, gaming console Sega made and I had pretty much forgotten I had these but the other day I was looking for some parts. I knew that I had the parts but I had no idea where they were so I went through all of my unlabeled boxes I didn't find the parts I was looking for, but I found these guys. I found a box with uh, the two Dreamcast machines, two of these controllers, which look like this. Kind of cool because they have the VMU, the uh, visual memory unit that you can remove and even play games on, but generally it's a memory card that has like uh, personalized displays on here and kind of a neat idea but uh, let's not uh, forget what we're here for that is uh, pretty much everything was unlabeled but uh, one of them had a tag on it that said good and one of them had a tag on it that said bad well I guess we're gonna have to verify that and uh, see what we can do about making them both good. So this one, even though you can't see it, it's nicely browned on the outside. My lights won't let you see it. The proper color is this, which is a light gray, but because of my bad lighting situation, you can't even see the difference, but this is gray and this is brown. So the sat in the sun. This is a good candidate for uh, ultra brighting. If of course well, remember, this was the one marked as bad, so we got to see. And then, of course, this one is the ultra rare Sega Sports Edition. And, uh, well, this one's good. Oh, another thing is that normally the uh, they had a modem that fit in here. A modem or basically a blank cover, but this one just had nothing. These both came from thrift stores. They were like... I don't remember. It was a while ago, but this one was like $5 and this one was $8. Which kind of made sense because this one didn't work and this one did work. But uh, the uh, Sports Edition one does have the modem. It's not just a blank cover. It's an honest-to-goodness modem here. So maybe we can have some online fun with it. But first thing we need to do is check them out. So I'm kind of a more of a, a glasses half full kind of guy, so let's try out the good one first. I remember a long time ago I repaired a couple of these and I think the soft spot on most of these or the point of failure was usually the, uh, the CD drive. It's not a regular CD, it's a GD-ROM, but we'll leave that for later what that exactly meant and in this case let's open her up I have a uh, copy of Toy Commander and let's see that's good CD had retracted and it's doing something. Usually when it gets this far that means it's good. The machine is good. Alright, so I mean we won't know for sure till we actually play a game but if it gets past, if it gets to this point it usually means this one is in working shape. All right, thank you. So the next thing we'll do is we'll plug power into this guy. Video. And a controller. And again. Here we go. I can't. 
can't hear the drive spinning or the head seeking. And we should, I mean, at least we should get a power-up screen, something that tells us this is a Dreamcast, but it's not doing that either. You can hear the fan running, but if we open it up, the CD isn't turning. So, uh, is the drive bad? One point of failure also on these is this thing actuates a switch on the inside that basically says CD door is closed. And these switches do oxidize quite for, uh, quite a lot. They're underneath. We'll have a look at it. And sometimes you can, by closing the door partially, the switch will make contact and you can kind of hear the uh, CD start spinning and then the minute you close it all the way it stops spinning. And that's a clear indication that that switch is dirty. But obviously on this one we cannot entice it to start spinning the disc. So yeah, well, the fan's good, the light's good, and that's about all that's good in here. So, we're going to have to have a look. Now since we have two machines, one working and one not, this is an ideal situation to try a new repair method methodology. And uh, that is, instead of actually testing electrically, is power supply good, we get signals here, blah blah, let's switch parts. The only question remaining is, so what do we do? Do we switch the parts from the bad one into the good one? Or from the good one into the bad one? Eh, it's sixes in the end. You could make arguments both ways that you could damage one of the machines doing that, but it really doesn't, it doesn't make a huge difference. So what I'm going to do is uh, use executive privilege and basically start swapping parts from this guy into this guy. Actually just swap them back and forth and that way we can verify whether something that came out of here works and if something that came out of here will make this start to work. So first step is get the covers off. So remove the modem from this one and take out four screws at each of the corners. The interesting part here is that the working one actually is a refurb. Now we all know refurbs, you know, the, something may have been actually wrong with it or somebody bought this thing and didn't like the color and return it or whatever, but this has been reconditioned and set to factory specs. Well, they did a good job, because this one still works. Whereas this one is not refurbed and doesn't work. Is there an 800 number on here? Maybe I can get them to fix it. And probably not. So, let's see. Oh, we still have the CD in here. I don't know, can you see that? Can you see that it's actually gray in here and brown out here? Well, anyway, that's what it looks like. Here's the little switch I was talking about that uh, this part this part here actuates when you open and close the door. And its brother or sister looks exactly the same. We have our power supply, the CD mechanism, and all the way underneath we have the CPU board or the motherboard, and then we have the I.O. interface over here. So, number one, let's see, what's, what's easiest to get out? Easiest to get out is the power supply. So let's do that. One very important thing to note is when you're using this methodology, uh, make sure that when you're swapping parts, you mark them clearly, which the original state or which machine it came from. How many times have I done something like this and not uh, mark the parts correctly and then sat there and not be able to figure out 
which was which. So we'll put a piece of blue tape onto the most dangerous part of the switching power supply. One of the most dangerous parts that there's a pretty high voltage coming through that. And excuse me, we will mark this one as well, if I write bad, then I'm going to think the supply is bad. So I'm just going to put a B on it to indicate that it came from the bad machine. And a G on it. You know what that means. Then, after not having properly uh, discharged any of the caps, Let's see what holds this in place. It's just, uh, I removed two screws from here and this connector. And then there's a connector, I guess, that feeds through to the main board. And uh, will just, should only be held in by the friction on that one. And we know exactly which is which now. So remember, I'm the uh, glass halfway full. So what I'm going to do is take the power supply out of the bad machine and put it into the good machine. Or into the uh, formerly good machine. I'm not even going to bother with CDs right now. I'm just going to see if I get a startup screen. Why doesn't this want to go in? That's why. So yeah, let's, let's just test it like this. No controller, no nothing. Let's just see if it comes up. And uh, well, looks like this one came up. Uh, let's try the CD. In order to try the CD, we have to keep this, the uh, latch, the door switch pressed down. It fits in here pretty tightly, so I think it's not going to fly off and slice through my throat, but, you know, just... The head retracted. This time it played a melody when coming up. It's spinning and for all intents and purposes that's working. So the power supply is not our source. So it, it doesn't even make sense to put the, the other power supply in here because we know the power supply, this power supply that was in here is good. So I don't even want to put that power supply in here if there's something in here that's going to mess up the power supply now. So, okay, step one. Step two, we got to get the drive mechanisms out. See if that's what's uh, making things not work. So I marked the, the drive assemblies. There's three screws actually. This is built really nicely. Where's my little pointer? There's three screws. One is hidden here, one is hidden here, and one is hidden here. But when you take those three screws out, it has the same kind of a connector like here that fits into the uh, that was good. Oh, come on. Oh, well, we'll find out if I ripped out the, any of the cables doing that little thing there. But here's your drive mechanism. And we can just swap that. Here's a connector. Now, if you want to take out, you know, the head assembly from the uh, electrical assembly and stuff, you have to take this off and, uh, you know, get out get out the little ribbon cables and all that good stuff. But for our test purposes right now, we don't need to do that. We're just going to swap them as a whole. So here's our 
drive out of the bad machine and why isn't it coming out? Because I forgot to remove a screw. Ah, those screws sure do their job. Okay. So all we do is it's got little guide pins here, put it in and press down on it and it's installed. So now we have the bad guys drive in here. It's making cracking noises, that's not good. And so why the power doesn't want to go in? Don't mess with me. Yeah, if you're trying to plug it into the wrong connector, then it won't go in. Don't do this at home. I just plugged AC into it. I had my fingers on it. Don't be stupid and don't do that. But so here's the bad drive. Here is the drive from the bad unit. Put the CD in. Press the door switch. The drive spinning, it's powering up, the disc speeds up, it's loading this one. So uh, I guess we're beginning to run out of options here because the only major assembly left in here is the main board. So now we're going to have to take a bunch of other things off to get to the main board, which is underneath here. If it's the main board, uh, I am afraid I can't give you a lot of hope of being able to fix it. But let's have a look at it. Let's get to it. And maybe we'll see something, some leaky caps maybe. Next we take out the controller interface. It has four screws, one two, three, four, holding it down. Don't pull on this part, even though it's loose, it doesn't, it doesn't come out with this. You have to kind of slip this one backwards before pulling it out. Has an interface cable, no latches on the connector, so you just pull them out and then put them back in. And last but not least, there is the uh, fan power connector, or the fan connector has three wires, so probably has a uh, an RPM, uh, a rotation measurement going back. Put that over here and take the same one out of here. And now we have these uh, this metal plate that is held in place by many, many screws. We're going to remove the many screws and that should afford us a view at the main board. So as I was starting to remove the numerous screws, basically taking the one out of the, 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 the good machine is kind of a fool's errand because we know that this board is working and we're guessing that this board isn't. But there really isn't anything in here other than this board, whatever's underneath here. So that's the culprit. That's what's bad. So all we really have to do at this point, using this methodology, is remove this board over here and give it a visual inspection, which is what we're going to do now. Let's see, there's one more screw stuck in here that doesn't want to come out. Why? There you go. Another thing is, uh, when you're taking these things apart, keep close track on what screw comes out of where. I'm kind of doing that. You can see back here how I got the screws lined up in little piles and in the order that I removed them. They're not only of a different color, but they're also of a different size. There, that's better. And... Uh, 
give you a comparison. These are the long screws that hold the front uh, the controller uh, PCB in place. And these are the shorter screws that are used to hold the shield in place for the uh, on top of the main board. It's very important uh, because you don't want to be putting the wrong screw in the wrong place. But back to what we were doing. Here is the old guy, so the uh, broken guy. Take the metal shield off. Has thermal pads here. One of the thermal pads stayed here. That's for the uh, most likely the process. I don't know if that's the processor or the GPU. And then the thermal pad for this guy stayed on the chip. So you don't want to be interchanging this with that one unless the uh, thermal pad's stuck in the same place. But we now have access to this PCB. And basically looking at it, seeing if there's anything any leaking caps that's you know that's about as far as we can go with this and why we got it open let me get my cheat sheet here and see what's supposed to be in here so what we have we have a Hitachi SH4 CPU and I'm guessing this is the CPU over here we then have an NEC Power VR2 GPU, which must be this, followed by a Yamaha. I can't read this again. It's a one one LCA. I probably wrote that down wrong, but basically, that is the sound chip has an ARM7 core and produces 64 PCM voices. Lots of DRAM. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This one may be SRAM. But basically this has oh uh, Oh, there is um, the CPU has 16, 16 has 16 megs of RAM. The GPU has 8 megs of RAM. So most hmm. So maybe this is the GPU. Eh, I don't know. If you do know, comment underneath. And this is the sound chip over here, and that has two megs. Of RAM. See if I can. No, this this one also says Sega on it, so which is kind of strange because Yamaha usually writes Yamaha on their chips, regardless of where they're going. But it's a best guess. Maybe this is the SH2 and this is the Yamaha. Don't really know. Doesn't really make a big difference because I think by now you figured out that. Uh, if anything's wrong with these chips, or I mean, if we can't see an obvious problem such as a leaky cap or anything, this is basically the end of the line. There's something wrong with this, and uh, I'm not so sure I can fix that. But let me have a closer look. Not much on the back, a few caps, some glue logic maybe. All looks good. So let me give this a closer look and see if there's anything I can see that you've already seen and you're yelling at me, hey, look at this. So I'll be back. All right. I think I found the problem. Only took me like 10 minutes or so. In all fairness, the reason I found it is uh, about 20 years ago, I was asked to have a look at somebody's Dreamcast who admitted that he'd taken it apart, and when he put it back together, it didn't work anymore. And I 
forget the reason why he took it apart and whatever, but I looked at it and it all boils down. Fortunately, I can't zoom in more, but do you see this? There's a depression here. Does that make it any more? Well, you can basically see that something impacted this area over here. Look at the fineness of the traces over here. These are all running underneath this big rectangle on the silk screen and coming out and then connecting to this chip. So something damaged this and because of the fine pitch of all the traces and stuff. This wrecked havoc underneath it. And now it's kind of interesting that they put this rectangle over here. I mean, was that supposed to be protection to prevent this? Uh, I don't know. They 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 would have had to do a lot better than just <laughs> using silk screen to protect this part. But I think the more interesting part is how does something like this happen? So let's reconstruct the uh, scene of the crime here, and I'll tell you exactly what happened. And yes, in case you're wondering. This is unrepairable. Unless you can turn yourself into a nanobot and go in and then remove the silk screen and repair the traces, whatever traces were broken here, there's no chance in hell to repair this. So the, to reconstruct the crime scene, we have to briefly put things together again. Now, remember where this damaged area is. And uh, let's see how's this going. So the damaged area is hint hint right underneath the screw hole. The screw hole is <clears throat> One of the holes that holds the uh, the DVD down. Remember, there's three screws: one here, one here, and one here. Now, remember, I told you to keep track of the screws and what came out of where. So. What you're supposed to be doing is, once you've taken it apart and done whatever it was you were doing, put the right screws in the right place. And uh, if you had lined them up correctly, you would immediately know that the screw you want to go in to this hole is this screw. Because that is the right length you know, to hold it, uh, to properly hold this drive to the top of the metal case, but not go down too deeply. So, what I found, or in the other case, I also had to guess because I didn't know exactly what screw came out of where, but my best guess is that one of these screws got put in here. That would explain the damage we just saw, because the screw is obviously longer, and if you tighten it all the way down, it would go and impact the PCB. This screw holds down the uh, controller PCB. It has four of them. They're long, and you know they have um, they have the space to hold those four and tightly hold the controller. PCB in place. So there you go. Mystery solved. When you take one of these apart, make sure you know exactly which screw to put where. Now I remember when I got that machine 20 years ago, it was the same symptoms. It, it came on, the fan blew, the light came on, but it wouldn't do anything. There was nothing on the screen. So the exact same symptoms as this one. So what happened 
is someone whom I leave unnamed took this thing apart and for whatever reason went all the way down to the PCB couldn't find anything and figured hey maybe if I put it all back together it'll start working again I put the wrong screw into here and that basically damaged damaged the uh, main PC board which I for one can't repair if you can let me know but uh, that's basically unrepairable mystery is solved but unfortunately machine is not fixed and cannot be fixed well I'm gonna put it all back together at least I have a trove of uh, spare parts now uh, guaranteed tested working on our wrong power supply so I got to change the labels on these but this is from the bad machine but it's the power supply that works and uh, this is a working drive also from the bad machine it works these things aren't that hard to replace if you have a machine and you really want to get it fixed I mean try the usual clean the uh, lens gently but beyond that I wouldn't bother because you can get on eBay you can buy replacement drives for about fifteen dollars from China so I wouldn't mess with it but the one thing that you could mess with remember I talked about this the, the switch that detects the door closure over here I mean if that's bad or intermittent it's kind of a painful process I remember that because you have to take this whole unit apart take out the bottom plate the PCB remove all of the ribbon cables that are in here till you get to the switch you unsolder it from underneath and then you can take the switch apart and actually clean up the corrosion on the contacts inside is that worth it uh, I don't know if I had that problem right now I'd be sitting on eBay and buying another drive from China but it can be done I done um, I didn't know I haven't done any of those because when I was repairing these they were too new to have all that corrosion on there and supposedly that's a problem now 20 years after the fact so I'm just gonna put the parts back in here I'm not gonna screw them together uh, I'm just uh, just basically gonna close it up and put a big sticker on it that says hey you know here's your parts machine and the next time I get a Dreamcast that needs anything other than the motherboard I'll already have all of the parts ready. All right, I've put the uh, good one back together again with all the right screws in the right place. I didn't put the top cover on because uh, I wanted to test it first. See if it's still good. Asking me for date time now. Oh, I guess I have to plug in the controller. Oh, oh, I need to press the uh, door switch and there we go at least I didn't break this one okay great it works let's put the cover on So everything went back together this one I just taped up and marked it so I know that there's some spare parts here when I get my next one that needs either a, a drive or a power supply and this one still works but figured I'd share some fun facts about the Dreamcast with you 
The Dreamcast was released in September of 1999 in North America, a few months earlier in Japan, and it was the first 6th gen console, home console. Now this one, uh, Sega decided to give it CD support, where pretty much everybody else that followed gave them DVD support. It wasn't a standard CD, it was called, uh, instead of a CD-ROM, it was called a GD-ROM that stood for uh, gigabyte ROM. So it was a CD with the capacity with the raw capacity of one gigabyte of data. It was developed by Yamaha and the purpose of it was first of all to have more storage and the second purpose was software piracy prevention because uh, the GD-ROM can't be read in a regular CD-ROM. It's not it's not fast enough because the pits are cl more closely spaced to give it more uh, capacity and uh, that's why. However, I think they made a bit of a mistake and uh, what Sega did was they said okay so our uh, GD-ROM is incompatible people can't rip us off and stuff like that but People are playing a lot of music CDs, so wouldn't it be nice if we could play music CDs and so you could add interactive features to it like menus and just a whole bunch of cool stuff. And the way they achieved that was they implemented the MIL CD standard, which stands for Music Interactive Live CD. Since this is capable of reading the larger formats, that the mill standard just allows it to basically slow down and read a 700 meg CD which was good and nice and people could could uh, you know play their CDs on here but what they didn't realize was that hackers basically came in and used that they started to copy GD-ROM games put them on CD-ROMs and then they hacked them to the mill CD interface so that this thing started reading games off regular CDs. There's only one problem with that, which you probably immediately realize, and that is GD-ROMs had a capacity of 1 gig, and most of the regular CDs had a capacity of 700 megs, which is GDs are 40, have 42% more storage than a CD-ROM. But they, they, the way they circumvented that was basically most of the space is taken up by audio files, and uh, so what they did on the uh, copied games the, is compress the audio or go to mono audio, whatever it took to get the capacity or the uh, storage requirements of a whole game down to 700 megs. And then they wrote boot up code, of course, that uh, used the CD mill or the mill CD ex exploit for the Sega to read the game off of a regular CD that you could burn on your on your burner. Now I don't think that had anything to do with this console not being very uh, successful. It lasted for about two years and then Sega pulled it and actually got out of the home arcade the hardware business completely. Just for comparison I mean the uh, the Dreamcast sold what about nine million units for you and me that's that's a lot of units but I guess after what they had put in for development on this and uh, coming off the Sega Saturn which was pretty much a sales disaster too for them they had a lot of money invested in this and I don't think the 9 million units was enough for them to continue doing it. For comparison's sake the uh, sixth generation home uh, consoles from the major competitors were the uh, Nintendo GameCube, which sold 22 million, the, uh, X, the original Xbox, which sold 24 million, and then uh, the Sony PlayStation 2, which sold 155 million over its lifetime. So Sega kind of figured out, eh, can't compete with that. So they left the market. Now, what was the reason? The games were pretty good. They had some some good innovation in game design and stuff like that. But 
One of the problems with this was, was it was during the internet boom when this came out, and they figured, hey, let's sell people a console, and then let's sell them extra stuff, like a modem, and a keyboard, and stuff like that, and make this their main computer. Well, that, that's been... <clears throat> I mean, the idea of making your game console your main computer has been tried before and has pretty much failed every single time. Also, it was a bad time, end of the 90s. The internet just, people's access to the internet wasn't fast enough. I mean, the modem, I'm not sure if that's a 28.8 modem that came with it, which you had to buy separately, of course, but people will go out, buy the modem, and then start playing online games I mean, the uh, star game for Sega was Fan Fantasy Star Online, which was new and people liked it. You had to go to a lobby and choose people for your group and all of that. But they quickly found out that to communicate with somebody in the lobby, you had to type in all your messages. And the on-screen keyboard on this just didn't do the job. So you had to go out and buy a keyboard, a specific keyboard that was incompatible with anything else. and. By that time, I think a lot of people figured, hey, uh, enough of this. If I want to get on the internet, I better go out and buy a computer. I think that contributed to it. Not Sega's fault, really. They made a good effort, but it was too soon. Now you might feel a little bad for Sega after having failed with this, but uh, they're not they're not run by stupid people. What they did was they took all of the Dreamcast electronics, doubled all of the memory, and made their real, their arcade cabinet hardware out of this. It was called the Naomi system, using the exact same hardware with twice the memory, which was very, very successful for Sega in the arcade market. So to wrap up, let's at least see what games look like on this. And uh, I've put in one of the most popular games made for the Dreamcast. And that was, uh, it's called Crazy Taxi. And for those of you wondering about the uh, silence, I actually filmed a segment where I played a game of Crazy Taxi and did pretty well, thank you very much. And then I realized that this game was one of the first games that actually had third-party licensed music on it. So uh, third-party licensed music would be picked up by YouTube and uh, I would probably be denied my twenty in ad revenue that I'm expecting to receive on this. And so, uh, I'm just going to let it run in mute fashion, so you can see the beautiful 3D graphics. Crazy Taxi was actually a big success also in the arcades. Sega built a stand-up arcade for this that had a chair, uh, a steering wheel, a gear shift for forward and backward, and brake and acceleration pedals. And then there was a deluxe version of that that had, a, in addition to all of this, had a seat on it. And uh, it was a pretty fun game. There wasn't a whole lot to learn. You steered, you pressed the gas, you pressed the brake, you picked up fares. Uh, I, did, I did try to film a game with the uh, without sound, but it's kind of dumb, so I think I want to pick another game where we don't have to worry about uh, violating anybody's music copyrights. Kind of cool though if you look at the uh, the VMU. Oh, you can hear somebody talking in there. Crazy taxi. Well, I guess I didn't turn the volume down all the way. Anyway, this is the VMU. It's kind of cool because they uh, changed a little pixel LCD display, show you what game you're playing, and uh, depending on the game, they uh, put different animations on here. But anyway, enough of the mute game. Let's put one in where we can play the sound without fear of persecution. Alright, so next we'll uh, 
play a game with sound. It's called Mr. Driller. It's a, a Tetris derivative. You drill through a bunch of blocks to get as far as you can while making sure that none of the ones you left behind fall on your head. And it also counts down your oxygen, which you have to keep replenishing by picking up uh, capsules in strategic locations. It's actually fun. Kind of fun. Well, you'll see. The town is being overrun by colored blocks. Twenty-five hundred feet, plenty for me. Recommended for beginners. Yeah, I'm a beginner. Here's a capsule. And I promptly get crushed. I didn't pick up the capsule because this early in the game you don't really need that many of them. Yeah, you need an anti-crush capsule. Not an oxygen capsule, but hey. Let's see if I can at least. No, that wasn't good. I can do better than this, I promise. Uh oh. Can you play a game with such happy music? I meant to say, not play a game with such happy music. Yep, that was a capsule. Scared me too, but... Oh... Made it to 500 feet. Oh, well, let it let it do its thing. Oh. All right, this this level is kind of interesting because it'll do a lot of your work for you. Blocks combine and disappear for a certain amount of time. And there's lots of capsules. And we made it to 1,500 feet. Now the oxygen situation is going to get serious. Because I think you use up oxygen a lot faster now. No! Oh! oh. Crash! 
Well, I promised you I'd do better. I think I fulfilled that promise. Oh, there's stuff hanging over my head. But I hear that noise, I'm out of oxygen. I suffocated, but I did better than before. So there you go. Well then, thanks for watching. Hope you had a great time. Oh, I'm sure you did. Thumbs up would be appreciated. Make sure to subscribe and leave me a comment. And I'll do my best to do in the next video to actually fix something. See you then and uh, stay safe.